While Dark Souls is best known for its fantastic gameplay, intricate level design with interconnecting paths, and of course, its challenge, the game also has incredibly deep lore. A lore is so deep that the pitch of my voice does it absolutely no justice, and you'll need a Vadi video to explain it to you. But while many lore scholars, including myself, look it up, I have years worth of videos diving into the subject, have looked into every little detail of the lore, both with wild theories and speculations, as well as grounded, solid research, there's still some elements of the game that have completely evaded us. Like, where are the top halves of the dragon butt demons in Isolith? How did their upper torsos melt off when it's their feet that are in the lava? If Nido has sentience and has the Death Lord's soul, isn't he technically undead? Like Is the undead of Dark Souls? Souls? The luckiest god of Why does he get a pass and all of his runs get a pass? When did he win? So join me as we go over some of Dark Souls' greatest mysteries, some of which we've solved and some of which still elude us to this day. Who is Gwyn's firstborn son? Within the flames, four beings found four different Lord Souls that granted them unimaginable power. The Witch of Isolith, the Life Soul, Nido, the Death Soul, the Furtive Pygmy, the Dark Soul, and Gwyn, the Light Soul. Gwyn, Nido, and the Witch of Isolith fought together against the reigning dragons to take control of the land. Fighting alongside Gwyn was his firstborn, whose name was essentially removed from the annals of history and his deific status was rescinded. On top of that, all statues of him were removed, so all honor and mention of him would be lost to time. And as such, it was a much debated mystery as to who this son was, what he did to deserve this punishment, and if he was even in Dark Souls 1. Before we proceed, this mystery contains spoilers from Dark Souls 3, so if you want to skip on to the next one, click on the timestamp below my face, and now on my face. Thanks, editor. The first possibility was everyone's favorite blacksmith and all-around badass, Andrea Vastora. According to an interview for the Dark Souls design works with Hidetake Miyazaki, Miyazaki stated that, Andrea Vistora was originally a descendant of Gwyn, whose task was to protect a door within the Firelink Shrine. In the end, he was going to push aside the goddess statue to let the players progress, but as development progressed, he became just a simple blacksmith. But you can't take cut content to be canonical, unless it's a lore theory that really, really needs it, in which case, don't worry about it, and I would never, ever do that. The second possibility, and one of the most popular theories, was that it was Soleil of Astora. You might be seeing a theme with Astora here. And if Andre was originally supposed to be Gwyn's firstborn, and he's from Astora, maybe there's some significance there. Soleil is a self-proclaimed adherent of the Lord of Sunlight. As an undead, he's come to the birthplace of Lord Gwyn to find his very own son. So, the theory goes, that he was estranged from Gwyn for some reason, however, still worshipped his father and came to Lordran to find his own son, which, of course, also represents Gwyn, the Lord of Light. After all, Gwyndolin had to even create a fake son to portray that Gwyn is still in power within the land of Anorlando. Finally, the most compelling evidence of all, according to the Ring of the Sun's Firstborn, Lord Gwyn's Firstborn inherited the sunlight, and if you join Soleil's Covenant as a shining member of the Warriors of Sunlight, you'll notice how intrinsically linked to Gwyn and the worship of him it is. The statue of this covenant is destroyed, making it likely it's a statue of the Firstborn. For joining, you'll receive Lightning Spear and at rank 1, Great Lightning Spear. You can even offer Gwyn's soul to receive Sunlight Spear. In other words, for joining the Sun Bros, you'll gain the ability to use Gwyn's Zeus-like attacks. All of this led to heavy speculation that Solaire was Gwyn's son, and this covenant a way he was trying to atone for his sins. But killing Solaire isn't considered a betrayal to the covenant, so maybe the crazed sun-obsessed loony is just a member as Gwyn is tied to the sun and sunlight. So at the end of the day, it was a compelling argument, but there were also enough holes in the theory that people weren't ever quite sure. I mean, why would Gwyn's son, who's likely a completely different race from that of the Furtive Pygmy, become undead in the first place? And it's always been my opinion that if there's a hole in the theory, then it's a sinking boat. And as it turns out, this one we can say is solved. 
Thanks to Dark Souls 3, we can now confirm that Gwyn's firstborn son isn't Andrea Vastora or even Solaire. It is, in fact, the newly introduced Nameless King. The Nameless King, who can be found at Archdragon Peak, arrives in fashion riding atop a Storm Drake, and his soul and item descriptions act as a tell-all. The Nameless King was once a dragon-slaying god of war before he sacrificed everything to ally himself with the ancient dragons. That's not unlike Gwyn's firstborn son, who was a god of war. His dragon slayer's sword spear was imbued with lightning, of which the Nameless King was the heir. And, of course, Gwyn's firstborn would have been the heir to lightning. So, once upon a time, the Nameless King fought alongside Gwyn in the Great Battle of the Ancients, where Gwyn, Nido, and the Witch of Isolith vied for control over the lands. He was so successful at this, he was clearly dubbed a god of war. However, at some point, the Nameless King tamed a Storm Drake, and this bond eventually led to him switching sides, similar to Seath, and betraying his own. Thus, while Seath gained rewards betraying the dragons, Gwyn stripped all honor and mention of the Nameless King for his betraying of Gwyn. So, we can deem this mystery of Gwyn's son solved. Next up, one of my favorite mysteries. What is the pendant for? At the beginning of the game, you'll be allowed to choose one starting gift to take with your character. The most practical, and in my opinion, fun of these is the Master Key, as this will open up multiple paths in the game without needing their normal keys, opening up the number of routes you can take right off the bat. The most interesting is the Old Witch's Ring, as it will allow you to talk with the Fair Lady. Meanwhile, Black Firebombs are fun, as you can quickly and easily kill the Asylum Demon at the start of the game without needing to run away and therefore get his drop, the Demon's Great Hammer. But one that has puzzled Souls veterans for years is... The Pendant. In an interview with Famitsu, the game's director, Hidetaka Miyazaki, suggested that when choosing a starting gift, he'd pick the pendant, or nothing at all. But here's the pendant's description. Trinket. No effect, but fond memories comfort travelers. Surely there has to be more to it than that, right? Dark Souls is filled with secrets, so there has to be something the pendant can do. Or at least that's what many gamers thought, and hoped, and I still hope beyond all hope. One thing you can do with the Pendant is trade it to Snuggly the Crow for a souvenir of reprisal. And... that's it. Players scoured the game for every possible way the Pendant could be used, but to no avail. So, was this just Miyazaki trolling everyone, or is there some deeper secret to it? And as much as I would love to say there's some secret thing the Pendant does, no one has found it yet. In a later interview with IGN, Hidetaka Miyazaki stated, When it comes to the pendant, I actually had a little bit of an intention to play a prank. Considering that at this point the game has been completely data mined, and people like Lance McDonald have shared that with all of us, well, I think we'd know by now if it did anything, and unfortunately, it doesn't. Outside of Snuggly, I mean. But that one doesn't matter. Sorry, Snuggly. Sadly, the pendant is also solved. Onwards to the best location of the game. What is the skull at Ash Lake? Ash Lake is my favorite area of Dark Souls. To discover it, you need to find and go through not one, but two illusory walls. It's incredibly well hidden, probably thanks to Gwendolyn, who I believe created all of the illusory walls in the game. Just saying. And it appears to be a relic of the Age of Ancients before the Lords took over, back when the Grey Stone Dragons ruled. It's also incredibly reminiscent of Nausicaa and the Valley of the Wind, which I'm totally okay with. Ash Lake raises so many questions. For example, to get to Ash Lake, you have to traverse down a giant hollowed out arch tree, the Great Hollow. And when you arrive, all you see around you are endless arch trees. So is the entire world built on top of these arch trees? Is this the foundation of all of the land as we know it? Interestingly, Ash Lake can be seen in the distance within the Tomb of Giants. There isn't much in Ash Lake except for the stone dragon, man-eater shells, and a mushroom parrot and basilisks, which probably made their way over from the Great Hollow, and, of course, a hydra, which unlike the previous hydra, can also leap. 
But one oddity we can find in Ash Lake is this giant skull. The skull is unlike anything else we've seen in the game. It doesn't resemble the nearby Hydra, nor does it resemble any other enemy or NPC. So, what skull is it? Given this is Ash Lake, and it appears similar to where the battle amongst archeries of the intro cutscene took place, a dragon skull seems like a reasonable deduction, but as the skull doesn't have an elongated snout, that kinda rules out a dragon. Some have speculated this could be the skull of a giant, as some believe that it resembles some of the skulls in the Tomb of Giants. I don't personally see it, and while it's still a viable theory, it's not one I can personally stand by. But at the end of the day, we really don't know, and it's a prominent set piece of Ash Lake, which is what makes it all that much more of a major mystery. Following up, a guessing game we've all pondered at. Who is the narrator? Who the narrator is, is a question that has evaded us since the dawn of Dark Souls, and we never really received an answer. Of course, it's possible this is just a generic narrator to explain the story without any real character, but that doesn't mean people haven't speculated that the narrator is someone important, and that's why they know so much about Dark Souls' story. Given the narrator's voice, this really narrows things down to being an older woman of some sort. The Witch of Izalith is a centipede bug monster, Guinevere seems to be too young to have this raspy of a voice, at least in the illusion that Gwendolyn created to portray her, it certainly isn't Quelana, because we know what she sounds like. The narrator is voiced by Peek Sen Lim, and she does no other voices within the game. So who could it be? Okay, so there's this theory that it could be Velka. Why? Velka is the goddess of sin. She is a rogue deity, but versed in arts both new and old, and is considered to have a great range of influence even as gods are concerned. So that fits with the idea of someone who would know enough to give us, the player, all of the backstory. But let's talk about crows for a moment. Within the painted world of Ariamis, crows and half-human crow hybrids are seen looking over and guarding various items related to Velka. In fact, within the design works, Miyazaki is quoted saying, The crow demons were originally designed as worshippers of the goddess Velka, whose bodies were warped by their devotion. I think this obsession makes them really interesting characters. Remember how I said cut content doesn't count unless I say it counts? It counts here. But that's really because there's plenty of in-game evidence to support that the crows are related to Velka. The crow demons happen to carry souvenirs of reprisal, which are directly related to the Book of the Guilty, maintained by Velka. So now that you know all about crows, let's look back at the intro cutscenes. In the second cutscene, where we hear the narrator speak, it's none other than a giant crow who takes the chosen undead to Lordran. So, if the crow who carries the chosen undead from the Undead Asylum to Lordran is in all likelihood related to Velka, does that mean the narrator is also related to, or possibly Velka herself? Well, no. That would be a pretty huge logic leap at this point. It's possible, but there really isn't any direct evidence. So, at the end of the day, we really have no idea who the narrator is, or if it's even supposed to be some character from the game. Making this mystery unsolved. So those were just some of Dark Souls' greatest mysteries. This is a new show idea for us, so if you liked it or not, let us know. And if you'd like to see another episode dedicated to Dark Souls, what are some mysteries you'd like to see covered, or other games? Let us know in the comments below, and hopefully I'll see you guys in another mystery video.